Good evening to everyone, welcome everybody. Um, this, this year we celebrate the 30th anniversary of Salone del Libro di Torino. Um, if you look at, at it from New York City, it is just uh, a book fair like many others around the world. But uh, every Italian reader knows that what Salone is. Uh, a place where for the first time since its, its first edition uh, we could meet our favorite writers from Italy and from all the, the world. Since the beginning the Salone hosted hundreds of thousands of people and hundreds of conversations and books presentations. For the first time there was a communication, a connection between readers and writers. You could ask why that salon is so crowded and the bookstores in Italy are too often almost empty, but this is another story. I think that for authors and publishing houses and readers, a place like Salone del Libro is something they couldn't do without. The salon is going to open tomorrow in Turin, and today, here, and in many other Italian cultural institutes, we introduce it with lectures and readings of local writers who speak about Italian authors. I'm very happy and proud to host in our institute William Finnegan. William Finnegan has been a contributor, a contributor to The New Yorker since 1984 uh, and a staff writer since 1987, reporting from Africa, Central America, South America, Europe, the Balkans, and Australia, and as well as from the United States. He has twice received the John Barlow Martin Award for Public Interest Magazine Journalism and twice been a National Magazine Award finalist. And I want to tell you that just this week there is a long and very interesting piece uh, by William Finnegan on, on The New Yorker. Finnegan is the author of five books, Crossing the Line, which was selected by the New York Times Book Review as one of the 10 best nonfiction books of the year, Dateline Soweto, A Complicated War, Cold New, New World, Growing Up in Harder Country, which was a finalist for the Ellen Bernstein Book Award for Excellence in Journalist, and Barbarian Days, his last one, which won a Pulitzer Prize for uh, biography and, autobi and autobiography in uh, 2016. Um, Barbarian Days is a memoir about a male friendship, and if you want, uh, you could buy a copy of it outside um, in the foyer and also a copy of the books uh, of Elena Ferranti, Ferrante and could sign, uh, William could sign a copy for you at the end of this event. And I think um, it's not by chance that he decided to read and to speak about an Italian writer, Elena Ferrante, for whom the friendship between women in her case is the main topic in her novels. William Finnegan will read from the first and the fourth novels of the series My Brilliant Friend. And please welcome William Finnegan. Thank you. two and three as well. <laughs> Thank you very much, and thanks very much for coming out. Um, as, it's nice to hear this recent book of mine um, described as a memoir about friendship, male friendship, because that was very much what I wanted to write, and, and I wrote this sprawling thing that took me forever and gets described many different ways. but. Um, that's sort of what I started out um, with and was intending. Um, and it is maybe the connection to this, I mean, what I wanted to talk about was 
uh, I didn't give this a lot of thought. I mean, I, I was asked, would you like to speak about, you know, a favorite Italian novel? And I said, oh, mm, 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 Ferrante, you know, how about the Neapolitan Quartet, the big four novel series? And yes, fine. And suddenly I was committed and here I am. Um, and I very much read her as a, as a reader, as a writer, not as a scholar. Um, I'm not an expert. And, and in fact, to talk about this quartet, I think I'd like, and it's a little informal, but I wonder if you wouldn't mind raising your hands, like if you've read these four novels, anybody? Like really read all of them? One. So quite a few people, but quite a few not also. So I think I want to read some passages and, and talk about it, um, the books, and um, I'll have to explain some, like who the characters are, some of the main plot points, so that they'll make sense. Um, I thought if like, everybody said, yes, I've, you know, we all know them totally, then I could skip that, but, but no. Um, and as, as I say, I, I feel sort of thematically connected to these novels, and I write nonfiction, so it's, you know, it's very, very different. But um, this theme, not just of obsessive friendship, I, you'd have to call it, um, but also the question of who has the right to tell whose story um, is just central to, I'd say, all of her work, perhaps, but certainly to these four novels, um, which form one big story, and, and you only... I mean, it's the kind of thing that the beginning only makes sense when you get to the end, the end, the end of the fourth, you know? And um, in fact, I was shocked. I, I mentioned to a friend today, a uh, colleague at The New Yorker, who I sort of read these books with as they were coming out in translation. Um, and uh, I mean, the fourth one came out as I was leaving on a trip to Asia, and I just read it on the plane and finished it as I landed in Indonesia. And it was just such a big thing. And she shocked me today. She said, I was talking to her about how, that, how it all ends, and she confessed that she had never read the ending. She couldn't bear it. She got 450 pages into the fourth volume and could not bear it. Um, and they're really intense books for those of you who haven't, haven't read them, haven't tried them yet. Um, and I said, what? And she said, but now you're telling me how it ends. It feels safe. I will read it. Like today, <laughs> she's been waiting two years or something. Just couldn't face what the enemy. But as I say, the the very beginning, uh, in time, you know, there's sort of about a lifetime from from childhood to to old age, and um, and about a friendship that spans that time, and it starts with you know I get a call, you know I can't find her. Where is she? Her friend has called from her son, um, and that's the beginning, and 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 it and she sort of takes off from there. But you only understand that situation, which is in the present, at the very, very, very end. And again, she's, she can't find her, and oh, here we are. So it's that kind of um, uh, span. And, and it's not, I'm going to read a few um, selections, a bunch of shortish um, excerpts to try to sort of illustrate themes. And, uh, and but there, it's not a pastiche, it's not a montage, just to give you a feel for it. I mean, it's a, it's a sort of sequence I want to read. But it's, it's, the book does not proceed, as you can tell from the beginning, here's the, you know, through chronologically, you know, simply through time. It circles and circles and circles. So the initial scene, for instance, after this phone call prologue, she's disappeared thing, the initial scene gets replayed many times and, and, and many of the key scenes reoccur and reoccur. You leap forward to the present a few times as, as she kind of, but it's broadly over four books. You go through childhood and adolescence and adulthood and into maturity. Um, I think I'll just start with um, a, uh, a little introduction of the friend. The narrator is, is uh, called Elena Greco. Um, she's a writer and, and in, in her uh, adulthood, um, but all her, her whole life she wants to be a writer. In fact, these, these two little girls, um, it, it starts off with a, a, a scene. They're little girls with, with dolls, and, and they exchange dolls, and her friend, whom she calls Leela, uh, throws her doll 
down a grate into a cellar. Ah. And so she throws her doll, and then they go sort of looking for them. And, and, and they go somehow up to the doorway of this feared mafioso. In, I should say, this is in a poor neighborhood in Naples just after the war, um, 40s, early 50s. And uh, that's the sort of opening scene. And, and the mafioso doesn't have their dolls, um, but he gives them some money. And, and uh, he's this fearsome figure they've approached. And, and rather than go buy new dolls, they go and buy a copy of the novel Little Women. Um, I suppose they're about eight, I mean, they can read. Um, but um, they're quite bright little things. And, and they read Little Women together over and over and over and over. They read it till it's falling apart and they just keep reading it together. And, and they conceive a great ambition to write novels and become rich. Uh, and, and so that's what they're going to do. And, and Leela actually writes a story called The Blue Fairy. Um, and, and Elena, the writer, is uh, just enthralled to this friend of hers. Um, I'll, I'll read the, her very first description of her. Um, it's, uh, it's not in that first scene, but, but it's, it's sort of like the first time I saw her type thing. Leela appeared in my life in first grade and immediately impressed me because she was very bad. In that class, we were all a little bad, but only when the teacher, Maestro Olivero, couldn't see us. Leela, on the other hand, was always bad. Once she tore up some blotting paper into little pieces, dipped the pieces one by one in the inkwell, and then fished them out with her pen and threw them at us. I was hit twice in the hair and once on my white collar. The teacher yelled, as she knew how to do, in a voice like a needle, long and pointed, which terrorized us and ordered her to go and stand behind the blackboard in punishment. Leela didn't obey and didn't even seem frightened. She just kept throwing around pieces of inky paper. So Maestra Olivero, a heavy woman who seemed very old to us, though she couldn't have been much over 40, came down from the desk, threatening her. The teacher stumbled. It wasn't clear on what, lost her balance and fell. Striking her, striking her face against the corner of a desk, she lay on the floor as if dead. What happened right afterward I don't remember. I remember only the dark bundle of the teacher's motionless body and Leela staring at her with a serious expression. This is Leela. She's a vivid child, let us say. Um, and the, I'm going to concentrate in these excerpts on, on this relationship, these two girls, um, but although there's a whole, this is a tremendous uh, canvas, you know, it's, it's a sort of Balzacian uh, novel of characters and, and mainly about Naples and mainly about this neighborhood, but it, it moves around Italy as, as they grow up. Um, she writes, I feel no nostalgia for our childhood. It was full of violence. Every sort of thing happened at home and outside every day, but I don't recall having ever thought that the life we had there was particularly bad. Life was like that, that's all. We grew up with the duty to make it difficult for others before they made it difficult for us. So, something of the... Um, and what happens between Elena and, and, and Lila over time is that uh, they're both from these very poor families, Helena, Elena's father is a, is a porter at City Hall, and, and Leela's father is a shoe, is a cobbler. Um, but uh, Elena continues with school, and, and Leela, as, as literary as, as she is, um, stops after fifth grade. Elena keeps going to school, and, and, and Leela stays in the neighborhood and works, um, and, and gets married very young at the age of 16, and so on, and their paths diverge. But the question is, again, who has the talent? Uh, because Elena is convinced that, that Leela is the brilliant one. My brilliant friend is an ironic phrase that Leela uses about Elena, the narrator, but, narrator, but Elena really feels that, that Leela is the brilliant one. I'll, I'll read you a couple of things that, that illustrate that. Um, Uh, she's at school, Leela's not. Um, but I soon had to admit that what I did by myself 
couldn't excite me. Only what Leela touched became important. If she withdrew, if her voice withdrew from these things, the things got dirty, dusty. Middle school, Latin, the teachers, the books, the language of books seemed less evocative than the finish of a pair of shoes, and that depressed me. She, Leela's thrown herself into her father's shoe business. Um, I wonder if I should, and it's almost like Elena is less real than Leela, and, and she really um, throws herself into sort of novelistically depicting Lena as well, Leela, excuse me, as well as sort of competing with her and, and, and questioning her, her own rights. Um, I'll read you a longer passage here about Leela's uh, sort of psychology as, as, as Elena understands it. On December 31st of 1958, Leela had her first episode of dissolving margins. The term isn't mine. She always used it. She said that on those occasions, the outlines of people and things suddenly dissolved, disappeared. That night, on the terrace where we were celebrating the arrival of 1959, when she was abruptly struck by that sensation, she was frightened and kept it to herself, still unable to name it. It was only years later, one night in November 1980, we were 36, were married, had children, that she recounted in detail what had happened to her then, what still sometimes happened to her, and she used that term for the first time. We were outside on the roof terrace of one of the apartment buildings in the neighborhood. Although it was very cold, we were wearing light, low-cut dresses so that we would appear attractive. We looked at the boys who were cheerful, aggressive, dark figures, carried away by the party, the food, the sparkling wine. They were setting off fireworks to celebrate the new year, a ritual in which, as I'll explain later, Leela had had a large role so that now she felt content watching the streaks of fire in the sky. But suddenly, she told me, in spite of the cold, she had begun to sweat. It seemed to her that everyone was shouting too loudly and moving too quickly. This sensation was accompanied by nausea, and she had had the impression that something absolutely material, which had been present around her and around everyone and everything forever, but imperceptible, was breaking down the outlines of persons and things and revealing itself. Her heart had started beating uncontrollably. She began to feel horror at the cries emerging from the throats of all those who were moving about on the terrace amid the smoke, amid the explosions, as if the sound obeyed new, unknown laws. Her nausea increased. The dialect had become unfamiliar. The way our wet throats bathed the words in the liquid of saliva was intolerable. A sense of repulsion had invested all the bodies in movement, their bone structure, the frenzy that shook them. How poorly made we are, she thought. How insufficient. The broad shoulders, the arms, the legs, the ears, noses, eyes seemed to her attributes of monstrous beings who'd fallen from some corner of the black sky. And the disgust, who knows why, was concentrated in particular on her brother, Reno, the person who was closest to her, the person she loved most. She seemed to see him for the first time as he really was, a squat animal form, thick set, the loudest, the fiercest, the greediest, the meanest. The tumult of her heart had overwhelmed her. She felt as if she were suffocating. Too smoky, too foul-smelling, too much flashing fire in the cold. Leela tried to calm herself. She said to herself, I have to seize the stream that's passing through me. I have to throw it out from me. But at that point she'd heard, among the shouts of joy, a kind of final detonation, and something like the breath of a wing beat had passed by her. Someone was shooting not rockets and firecrackers, but a gun. Her brother Rena was shouting unbearable obscenities in the direction of the yellow flashes. On the, occasion when, on the occasion when she told me that story, Lisa also said that, that the sensation she called dissolving margins, although it had come on her distinctly only that once, wasn't completely new to her. For example, she'd often had the sensation of moving for a few fractions of a second into a person or a thing or a number or a syllable violating its edges. And the day her father threw her out the window, broke her arm, she was a little girl, threw her out the window, she'd felt absolutely certain as she was flying toward the asphalt that small, very friendly reddish animals were dissolving the composition of the street, transforming it into a smooth, soft material. But that New Year's Eve, she'd perceived for the first time unknown entities that broke down the outline of the world and demonstrated its terrifying nature. 
This had deeply shaken her. When Leela's cast was removed and her arm reappeared, pale but perfectly functioning, her father, Fernando, came to an agreement with himself and without saying so directly, but through Reno and his wife, Nuncia, allowed her to go to a school to learn, I don't know exactly what, stenography, bookkeeping, home economics, or all three. She went unwillingly. I say, Leela is, is her great subject. And um, uh, she has this, this feeling, um, which strangely um, I can relate to, um, that, that only what Leela touched became important, as I say. Um, and around this time, Leela switches um, from literature as the way to get rich and the thing to do to business. As I say, she goes into her father's shoe business and she designs shoes. Later, it's grocery. She marries a grocer, uh, sort of the wealthiest kid around that part of town. And, and later, it's software. Believe it or not, she starts a software company and does quite well. Um, and, uh, and the whole time, Elena is convinced that, that Leela is, while she's making her way as a writer, she goes on to study and gets a degree in classics and, and writes a novel and, and becomes a writer in the world outside Naples. She ends up marrying and living in, in Florence, marries a professor. Um, but uh, the whole time she feels like, like Leela's reality is more vivid. Leela has the talent. There's a um, little passage I really like, uh, or not so little, but... Um, where she gets a letter, um, they're 15 at this point, um, but let's say Leela's about to get married, so they're not like our 15-year-olds, these are 15-year-olds <laughs> uh, in Italy in the 50s. Um, and uh, she gets this letter, uh, or she's, she's at the, the beach with some friends for the, for the at a place called Ischia, um, an island near, near Naples, um, working as a nanny, um, but she gets a, I stuck my head out the window. The postman said there was a letter for Greco. That's her. I ran down with my heart pounding. I ruled out the possibility that my parents had written to me. She's been writing to Leela and writing to her, writing to her. Leela never writes back. Um, it was from Leela. I tore open the envelope. There were five closely written pages, and I devoured them. But I understood almost nothing of what I read. It may seem strange today, and yet it really was so. Even before, I was overwhelmed by the contents. What struck me was that the writing contained Leela's voice. Not only that, from the first lines I thought of the Blue Fairy, the only text of hers, I'd re hers that I'd read, apart from our elementary school homework, and I understood what, at the time, I'd liked so much. There was in the Blue Fairy the same quality that struck me now. Leela was able to speak through writing. Unlike me when I wrote, unlike Saratore, this is this guy she's staying with, in his articles and poems, unlike even many writers I'd read and was reading, she expressed herself in sentences that were well-constructed and without error, even though she'd stopped going to school. But further, she left no trace of effort. You weren't aware of the artifice of the written word. I read and I saw her. I heard her. The voice in the writing overwhelmed me, enthralled me even more than when we talked face to face. It was completely cleansed of the dross of speech, of the confusion of the orderly, of the confusion of the oral. It had the vivid orderliness that I imagine would belong to conversation if one were so fortunate, fortunate as to be born into the head of Zeus and not from the Grecos, the Cherulos. That's, she's a, that's her last name, Cherulo. Um, she goes on about this letter and how, what was in it and how it disturbs her. Um, Lila's world, as usual, rapidly superimposed itself on mine. Everything that I had written, she's busy writing, in July and August seemed to me trivial. I was seized by a frenzy to redeem myself. I didn't go to the beach. I tried immediately to answer her with a serious letter, one, had, one that had the essential, pure, yet colloquial tone of hers. But if the other letters had come easily to me, this I wrote, rewrote, rewrote again, and yet Nino's hatred of his father, that's the family she's staying with, the role that the affair of Melina had had in the origin of that ugly sentiment, my entire relationship with the Saratore family, even my anxiety about what was happening to her came out badly. Donato, who in reality was a remarkable man, on the page became a banal family man. And as far as, I, as, far as Marcello was concerned, this is her big problem, Lila's, I was capable only of superficial device, advice. In the end, all that seemed true was my disappointment that she had a television at home and I didn't. Um, 
I don't know how many people feel this in their lives, but this all, I also have a, an old friend um, who's sort of the central character in this, in this memoir, um, whom I've, who's a great correspondent, and, and I've forever felt this. I mean, the, these letters, I, to this day, come and come, and I just, they sort of superimpose themselves on my world, and I, and I it, he has a, a sort of gift for, for disappearing um, and, 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 and sort of transmitting clearly through prose um, that I, I've sort of aspired to my, my whole life. So I really, really identify with this. Um, let's say that, that this fellow is also a writer. He, he did finish college. <laughs> and, um, and as I say, is the main character in, in my book, Barbarian Days. Um, so I really, really relate to this stuff. Um, there's, um, this is just a very short, bit um, where she is, uh, Elena is seeing a professor of hers um, who would remember Leela from childhood. Leela's now, let's say, 16, getting married, um, kind of suddenly uh, very beautiful uh, in a grown-up way. The teacher praised me, but carelessly, partly because by now she took my ability for granted. Elena's headed to university. Partly because she wasn't well. She never mentioned my need to rest her cousin Nella Ischia. And instead, surprisingly, she began to talk about Leela. She'd seen her on the street from a distance. She was with her fiance, the grocer. Then she added a sentence that I will always remember. The beauty of mind that Chorulo had from childhood didn't find an outlet, Greco. And it, had, and it has all ended up in her face, in her breasts, in her thighs, in her ass, places where it soon fades, and it will be as if she'd never had it. I had never heard her say a rude word since I'd known her. That day she said, ass, and then muttered, excuse me. But that wasn't what struck me. It was the regret, as if the teacher were realizing that something of Leela had been ruined because she, as a teacher, hadn't protected and nurtured it well. I felt that I was her most successful student and went away relieved. That aspect of competition is that what I'm going to emphasize um, from here on, because it gets it gets more and more intense and sort of toxic, um, I think, um, and and even when Elaine is becoming established as a writer, uh, when she can get Leela to even look at one of her essays uh, with a few marks, is suddenly you know twice as good, and and this is a girl who hasn't gone to school since the fifth grade. Um, and, and Elena just, you know, chafes and chafes at this. And, and, and it gets more and more complicated, their, their situation, as, as they're both in love with the same boy. Um, and, and ultimately, he actually fathers a child with each of them, um, although there's some confusion about who the father of Leela's first child really is. Um, but um, he's this intellectual and, and, and a kind of a bounder. Um, his father, actually, this sort of spoiler alerts, I don't know, you'll forget all this if you haven't read it, but his, his father actually takes the virginity of Elena um, in an incredible scene, just an absolutely gorgeous scene. Uh, I mean, it's gross, it's this you know, older guy, but um, it's, it's really beautifully done, and from, all from her point of view, of course, and, and, and how she experiences, how she feels about it, it's, it's something she's sort of glad to have over with, but she immediately, even that night, right, virtually there, starts thinking about Leela's experience. Was it different? Was it better? And she's, and she's not just sex, but and then eventually she gets some notebooks that Leela's been keeping, and and goes through it. And and indeed, it was better. Not sex again, but but her love for the the boy, not the dad, but this this brilliant boy, Nino, and and and. And Elena is just, you know, green with envy, reading this sort of beautiful evocation of this, the sort of love that she never really, I mean, she was in love with this guy, but, but never really felt like she, she had in her life. And, and yet Leela, who, who uh, as I say, married this successful grocer at 16, but by 19 or 20 is, uh, has left him and, and uh, for this kid and, and is a single mother working in a sausage factory. That was just this brutal, brutal um, 
uh, place to work, and and uh, it's uh, has anything but an easy life. Um, let me read you another little short passage. Um, I'm getting my books mixed up. There are four of them, um, and this is a uh, Elena is now married to a professor in Florence, and she's pregnant, and uh, she. Uh, goes back to Naples and, and sees Leela, who's already had a child, um, and immediately kind of takes possession of this one. Um, she's surprised she's pregnant, and, 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 and how are you doing? Uh, pretty well, but I don't ever want to be pregnant again. She was silent, and I didn't say anything either. When she began talking once more, she told me about the first time she'd realized she was expecting a baby, and the second she had a miscarriage. She described both as terrible experiences. The second time, she said, I was sure the baby was Nino's. That was just confusion. And even though I felt sick, I was happy. But happier or not, you'll see, the body suffers. It doesn't like losing its shape. There's too much pain. From there, she went on in a crescendo that got darker and darker, telling me things she'd told me before, but never with the same desire to pull me into her suffering so that I, too, would feel it. She seemed to want to prepare me for what awaited me. She was very worried about me and my future. This life of another, she said, clings to you in the womb first, and then when it finally comes out, it takes you prisoner, keeps you on a leash. You're no longer your own master. With great animation, she sketched every phase of my maternity, tracing it over hers, expressing herself with the habitual, her habitual effectiveness. It's as if you fabricated your very own torture, she exclaimed. And I realized then that she wasn't capable of thinking that she was herself, and I was myself. It seemed to her inconceivable that I could have a pregnancy different from hers and a different feeling about children. She so took it for granted that I would have the same troubles that she seemed ready to consider any possible joy I found in my motherhood a betrayal. This, is, um, this gets to be a, th a theme, this what constitutes a betrayal. Um, Giorgio mentioned earlier that that the word for translation in Italian is just one tick away from the word for to betray. Um, I don't know how many of you speak Italian, but I believe him. <laughs> and uh, and, and um, that really becomes a, um, a theme in here. Um, in fact, uh, maybe one more thing from that volume, just a, a little sort of preview of the sort of main ultimate conflict that sort of produces these books. Um, this is where she really jumps forward at one point. Um, I talked about it with Lila that afternoon in the winter of 2005, um, emphatically and as if to make amends. Uh, oh, sorry, she's talking, this is uh, Elena talking about how she sort of finds that not just the neighborhood is sick, not just Naples, but the entire earth, the universe or universes. I talked about it with Leela that afternoon in the winter of 2005, emphatically and as if to make amends. I wanted to acknowledge openly that she had understood everything since she was a girl without ever leaving Naples. But I was almost immediately ashamed. I heard in my words the irritable pessimism of someone who was getting old, a tone I knew she detested. In fact, in a nervous grimace of a smile that showed her old teeth, she said, are you playing the know-it-all, the moralizer? What do you intend to do? You want to write about us? You want to write about me? No. Tell the truth. It would be too complicated. You've thought about it, though. You're thinking about it. A little, yes. Let me be Le Nu. That's what she calls Elena, Le Nu. Let me be Le Nu. Let us all be. We ought to disappear. We deserve nothing. Neither Giliola nor me. No one. Dill is an old friend of those who just died. That's not true. She had an ugly expression of discontent, and she scrutinized me, her pupils hardly visible, her lips half parted. All right, she said. Write if you want. Write about Giliola, about whoever you want. But about me, no. Don't you dare. Promise. I won't write about anyone, not even you. Careful. I've got my eye on you. Yes? I'll come look in your computer. I'll read your files. I'll erase them. Come on. 
You think I'm not capable of it? I know you're capable, but I can protect myself. She laughed in her old, mean way. Not from me. She, but I should say, while she's not a you know hacker, um, <laughs> um, as at this point has had a software company. She's had uh, sort of self-taught with a, her partner, a guy she doesn't marry, but she has another child with. Um, a kind of wonderful guy, one of the few male characters to admire in this book, a guy named Enso. Um, uh, they sort of self-teach themselves, they teach themselves Boolean algebra and become software people and, and uh, employ a lot of others and, and, and do quite well. So when she says, I can come in your computer, you know, oh, Ann doesn't know, maybe she can't, you know. A um, couple more. Um, then I'd be very interested to hear what, what you guys are interested in. Um, I guess I should say that um, a, a terrible thing happens. Um, the, the last uh, book is called The Story of the Lost Child. Um, and what that refers to is um, uh, well, it's, it's, it's complicated like everything in the book, but um, Elena has come back to Naples um, with her now three daughters, two from the professor and one from this fellow, Nino, um, who doesn't take any responsibility for the child. Um, and, uh, and Lila has a second child with Enso. And, and they're sort of pregnant together and, and they have two daughters. They each have a daughter at, at same age. Um, so they're sort of raising them together. And there's this uh, moment when uh, Tina, who's Lila's daughter, not yet four, um, disappears. Um, she's there one moment, and the next moment she's not. And, uh, and she's never found. And, and there are you know, endless theories, you know, the police and accusing this one, that one, the gypsies. The, you know, there's many, many theories, a truck, something. And, and, but in the moment when she was last seen, uh, this guy Nino happens to be visiting and, and Lila is lifting Elena's daughter, whose name is Ima, I-M-M-A, uh, to him, kind of really getting his attention between her, who's an old girlfriend of his, and, and, and his daughter, and, and neglects her daughter just very briefly, and, and she's gone. So for the rest of the story, the rest of the novel, she's, Lila is just completely wild with grief and, and, and becomes just an impossible person and, and has lots of theories and can never sleep. And, and um, uh, in fact, I'll, I'll read you just one of the theories. There are many theories. Um, it's a, uh, um, comes rather, rather late and uh, it really out of the blue. Um, and, and Lila sort of takes over um, helping raise Ima, the, the Elena's daughter who's, who's still with us, um, as a kind of surrogate and, and, and takes her around Naples and is teaching her all this stuff and trying to be, you know, alive and, and um, and it gives time, Elena time to write. And Elena does seem to have made her career a lot on the basis of having a kind of um, real working class upbringing in Naples and then entering into this, this world of, of the arts and, and politics and, and uh, fem feminism in the 60s and the 70s. And, um, but with this kind of um, rootsy, background that she's able to invoke. I mean, her first novel includes a, a thinly disguised version of her, this, this scene where she loses her virginity to the, this railway conductor, the father of her boyfriend. Um, and, uh, and it's sort of a scandalous scene on the beach and you know, makes it a sort of success of scandal, this novel. And so she seems to have drawn on that really through much of her writing, um, but has never really taken it on directly. Um, and, uh, so this, this is one of, one of Lila's theories about what happened to her daughter. Um, uh, Elena is thanking her for all the help she's given her with, with her daughter, Emma. Uh, I've always helped Emma, not just now. 
Yes, but after Nino's troubles, you were really helpful to her. She didn't like those words either. It was a moment of confusion. She didn't want me to associate with Nino, that guy, the attention she devoted to Ima. Uh, it, she reminded me that she had taken care of the child from the start. As I say, there was, in that moment, that guy was there. Um, she said she had done it because Tina loved her dearly. She added, maybe Tina loved Ima even more than me, more than her mother. Uh, then she shook her head in discontent. I don't understand you, she said. What don't you understand? She became nervous. She had something in mind that she wanted to tell me but restrained herself. I don't understand how it's possible that in all this time you never thought of it even once. Of what, Leela? She was silent for a few seconds, then spoke, eyes down. You remember the photograph in Panorama, a magazine. Which one? The one where you were with Tina and the caption said that it was you and your daughter. Of course I remember. I've often thought that they might have taken Tina because of that photo. What? They thought they were stealing your daughter and instead they stole mine. She said it and that morning I had the proof that of all the infinite hypotheses, the fantasies, the obsessions that had tormented her, that still tormented her, I had perceived almost nothing. A decade hadn't served to calm her. Her brain couldn't find a quiet corner for her daughter. She said, you were always in the newspapers and on television, beautiful, elegant, blonde. Maybe they wanted money from you and not from me, who knows? I don't know anything anymore. Things go one way and then they change direction. Um, and then to the, near the end of the book, um, uh, where you're approaching the present and uh, and Elena is keeps imagining that that Lena is actually writing a great book um, that all this research she's doing around Naples taking her daughter little daughter Ema um, around and every building every street she can tell an incredible story and and she really seems to know an awful lot. She's always been a big denizen of the library. Um, and, uh, and Elena gets in her mind she's writing a huge book that will include her daughter's disappearance somehow worked into this fantastical history of their city. Um, and at one point she imagines it as such. Um, she, she's getting quite depressed. Her career is kind of... Uh, uh, gone downhill, Elena's. Um, in the moments of greatest darkness, I was sure that Leela had written the detailed story of her daughter, sure that she had mixed it into the history of Naples with the arrogant naivete of the uneducated person who perhaps for that very reason obtains tremendous results. Then I understood that it was a fantasy of mine. Without wanting to, I was adding apprehension to envy, bitterness, and affection. Leela didn't have that type of ambition. She had never had ambitions. To carry out any project to which you attach your own name, you have to love yourself. And she had told me she didn't love herself. She loved nothing about herself. On the evenings of greatest depression, I went so far as to imagine that she had lost her daughter in order not to see herself reproduced, in all her antipathy, in all her malicious reactivity, in all her intelligence without purpose. She wanted to eliminate herself, cancel all the traces, because she couldn't tolerate herself. This is, of course, kind of where the novel begins and ends. Um, and then here's a, a, a passage where that sort of key thing comes into focus, I think. Um, the story that I later called a friendship originated in that mildly depressive state in Naples during a week of rain. Of course, I knew that I was violating an unwritten agreement between Leela and me. I also knew that she wouldn't tolerate it. But I thought that if the result was good, in the end she would say, I'm grateful to you. These were things I didn't have the courage to say even to myself, and you said them in my name. There is this presumption in those who feel destined for art and above all literature. We act as if we had received an, invest in, an investiture. But in fact, no one has ever invested us with anything. It is we who have authorized ourselves to be authors. And yet we are resentful of others say, this little thing you did doesn't interest me. In fact, it bores me. Who gave you the right? 
Within a few days, I wrote a story that over the years, hoping and fearing that Leela was writing it, I had imagined in every detail. I did it because everything that came from her, or that I ascribed, ascribed to her, has seemed to me since we were children more meaningful, more promising than what came from me. When I finished the first draft, I was in a hotel room with a balcony that had a beautiful view of Vesuvius and the gray semicircle of the city. I could have called Leela on the cell phone, said to her, I've written about me, about you, about Tina, about Ima. Do you want to read it? It's only 80 pages. I'll come by your house. I'll read it aloud. I didn't do that out of fear. She'd explicitly forbidden me not only to write about her, but also to use persons and episodes of the neighborhood. When I had, she always found a way of telling me, even if painfully, that the book was bad, that either one is capable of telling things just as they happened in teeming chaos, or one works from imagination, inventing a thread, and I had been able to do neither, the first thing nor the second. So I let it go. I calmed myself, saying, it will happen as it always does. She won't like the story. She'll pretend it doesn't matter. In a few years, she'll make it known to me or tell me clearly that I have to try to achieve more. In truth, I thought, if it were up to her, I would never publish a line. The book came out. I was swept up by a success I hadn't felt for a long time, and since I needed it, I was happy. A friendship kept me from joining the list of writers whom everyone considers dead, even when they're still alive. The old books began to sell again. Interest in me was rekindled. In spite of approaching old age, life became full again. But that book, which at first I considered the best I'd written, I later did not love. It's Leela who made me hate it. By refusing in every possible way to see me, to discuss it with me, even to insult me and hit me. I called her constantly. I wrote endless emails. I went to the neighborhood. I talked to Reno, her son. She was never there. And on the other hand, her son never said, my mother's acting like this because she doesn't want to see you. As usual, he was vague, he stammered. You know how she is. She's always out. She either turns off the cell phone or forgets it at home. Sometimes she doesn't even come home to sleep. So I had to acknowledge that our friendship was over. Let me read a little bit more of this, just so you get a feeling for what this, this essay was, how deep a betrayal it was. In fact, I don't know what offended her, a detail, or the whole story. A friendship had the quality, in my opinion, of being linear. It told concisely, with the necessary disguises, the story of our lives, from the loss of the dolls to the loss of Tina. Where had I gone wrong? I thought, this is unbelievable to me, where had I gone wrong? I thought for a long time that she was angry because, in the final part, although resorting to imagination more than at other points of the story, I related what in fact had happened in reality. Leela had given Ima more importance in Nino's eyes, in doing so had been distracted, and as a result, lost Tina. But evidently what in the fiction of the story serves in all innocence to reach the heart of the reader becomes an abomination for one who feels the echo of the facts she has really lived. In other words, I thought for a long time that what had assured the book's success was also what had hurt Leela most. Later, however, I changed my mind. I'm convinced that the reason for her re repudiation lay elsewhere, in the way I recounted the episode of the dolls. I, deliber I deliberately exaggerated the moment when they disappeared into the darkness of the cellar. I had accentuated the trauma of the loss, and to intensify the emotional effects, I had used the fact that one of the dolls and the lost child had the same name. The whole led the reader step by step to connect the childhood loss of the pretend daughters to the adult loss of the real daughter. Leela must have found it cynical, dishonest, that I had resorted to an important moment of our childhood, to her child, to her sorrow, to satisfy my audience. And she goes on speculating about that so obtusely, if I may say so. Um, it's as if, I mean, Elena Ferrante in the end, this Elena Greco, who's so much a stand-in for you know, a writer, it's as if she doesn't really want us to, to, I mean, in the end, I find it very, very hard to like her. Um, let me just read one last thing, a little thing from the beginning, because I'm interested to hear what you're interested in. Um, where is it? Um, 
which as I say makes sense only when you've read the whole thing. Um, there's a little more after that, but, but I mean, she never sees Leela again. Leela never speaks to her again. Um, uh, right at the, oh, it's at the top of this book, not that book. So many books. Um, is when she gets a call from Reno saying, you know, my mother's disappeared and she's annoyed and trying to find her, look here, look there, and she really, really disappeared. I mean, everything was gone, and every, every trace of her. And, and she, Elena writes in a little prologue to this whole quartet, I was really, ang really angry. We'll see who wins this time, I said to myself. I turned on the computer and began to write all the details of our story, everything that still remained in my memory. We'll see who wins this time. So um, it's this tremendous story and this tremendous meditation on this theme of betrayal and, and as I say, who, who has the right to tell whose story. Um, which I'll just close by saying um, is, is a real theme in, in the kind of work I do. I um, mostly do this sort of long form narrative journalism um, and uh, often about poor and powerless people um, in different parts of the world, also in the US, and people who really have no voice. Um, and yet I arrogate to myself the, that role um, and then in this recent book, this memoir, the first thing of that sort I've written, it's even more acute in many ways. It's not a professional question. It's, it's a personal question. Um, because now you're talking about private life, people with whom, you know, nothing was on the record. This is, this is your life. These are the people, you, your family, your friends, the people you spent your life with. And and uh, and you're arrogating to yourself the the right to pick all these shared unguarded moments and with loved ones and and now putting them in front of the world and in my case is as nonfiction people using people's real names very very dicey business and uh, different of course in fiction um, but but um, at least as 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 vexed in my experience. Listen, thanks. Thank you, Thank you very, very much. Okay.